This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to What Do the Scriptures Say? We are pleased that you have tuned in, and today you're in for a special treat. I'm going to introduce you to one of the greatest preachers and authors, Bible teachers, professors in this world, Jim McGuigan from Belfast, North Ireland, in a special series of lessons which Jim taped at his home in Belfast. He talks to us about God, the, the cross, and God's character. And this morning, you're going to be blessed with part one of this very, very special series. If you want to get us a Bible question, if you need help in your Bible study, please call or write to me on the numbers at the numbers on your screen. If we can help you in any way, get in touch with us. But here's Jim from Belfast, North Ireland. God bless you. Father, we wish to apologize for grieving you so. And we do despise our own sins above every other evil. Because they so displease thee, O oh, our Lord, who for all your goodness and kindness toward us, all the days of our lives, merit nothing but our praise and adoration and devotion. And we vibe by your grace to amend our lives and if you will as you've always done sustain us we beg you to let us be a part of your redeeming work help us to see you more clearly love you more dearly and follow you more nearly day after day after day we pray in Christ and for his dear sake Amen Scriptures talk a lot uh, about Christ in metaphors talks about him being bread, maybe a door, a sheepfold even, shepherd, water of life in, in some texts. There's a lot said about him in association with, uh, with the cross. Peter said, who in his own body bore our sins, the Greek says, up onto the tree. G.K. Chesterton said, well, he said 1900 years. We'd say 2000. Chesterton said, a man came into my world 2,000 years ago, and I can't, I can't look at a tree without thinking of him. That's the direction that your lives go in. Whether it's bread or furniture, some carpenter 
you're doing is business. A sore, a farmer doing his. A woman baking bread. All that stuff. Everything speaks to us about him. Everything. The fish swim him. Birds fly him. Oxen pull him. Changed the world, hasn't he? It all comes to focus in uh, the cross. The creation speaks volumes. And it makes sense for us when we're reading the Bible or thinking about things to begin at the creation. And Paul and others will do some of that. But that's not really what they do. Paul doesn't begin with the creation. He begins with Christ and works back to the creation. Maybe you've noticed that a time or two. In Colossians 1.15 it says he's the, uh, the image of the God you can't see. He's the firstborn, the leading one of all creation. And then he says in him, not by, in, in him, all things were created. And then he goes on to say, through or by him, all things were created. And then he says, unto him, all things were created. Three different prepositions in Colossians 1. 15 and 16. You know what he did there? You know what Paul did there? He said, you can enjoy the creation, but you don't really know it till you know Jesus Christ. For it was in him, in the sphere of Jesus Christ, that creation took place. It's in the thought of him. It's within the parameters of of what Jesus Christ means that the creation uh, took place. And then it says, uses a preposition, dia. It was all made through or by him. And then it says, and it was all made unto him or for him. What does that mean? It means that when the Godhead got out their big shovels and started digging to lay the foundations of the world, the thought in their mind, the parameters within which they worked, Christ. And he is the directing agent of it all. And he is the one for whom it was being built. So that when Paul sees the glorified Christ, he sort of says, Ah, finally, I meet the one for whom everything is made. But you only understand all of that when you see the finished Christ, so to speak when you work through his incarnation, his life. Glorious, brave, joy-filled, gallant life and his holy, obedient and joy-filled death, his triumphant resurrection and this inexpressibly glorious exaltation. Then you look at that and you say, that's why there is anything. Isn't that a great story? But it's
it's at the cross where all of that is worked out. Everything else is a part of that. But it's at the cross where it all comes to focus. Calvin Miller has taught us that uh, some of the world's most loved fairy tales begin with once upon a time. But the most beloved true story with all of the magic could begin with once upon a tree. And it's it's once upon a tree that you discover the character of God. Plutarch, Plutarch said, I would rather, people said, I would rather people said there never was a Plutarch. As to say, yes, there was a Plutarch. He was stingy and mean, easily provoked, spiteful, and on he went. He said, I would rather that people said there wasn't a Plutarch is to say there was, and him be like that. See, so for you and me, and this is important for us to um, remember, for you and me it isn't enough to argue with an atheist and say, God exists. I don't mean to be rude. Honestly, I don't. But to believe that Kali exists, or Zeus, or Hephaestus, or Aphrodite, you what? Would rather believe they never existed as believe such beings existed. And God? You know what God would say if you walked into your building right now? I would rather they said there isn't any God is to say he's mean, spiteful, uses people like pawns, has a little play, gets it all going and then dumps us. And me, personally, I would rather people said there was no God is to say there was a God who made multiplied millions of us for no other reason than to eternally damn us and consciously torment us because it pleases him. That, that's not the God of scripture. That's not the God of the cross. A God like that, said John Wesley to a fellow called Whitfield. He said, Whitfield, your God is my devil. So here's, here's what's grand about the cross. Here's what's grand about our story. At the cross, God reveals his character. It's there you get to know him. Read Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 and find your head swimming. What's this? Uh, what's this eternal decrees business? What's this foreordination stuff? I'm all mixed up. Get mixed up all you want. Get confused about all the decrees and how you make that verse fit in with that and what compatibilism is and how it works with the other. Do all of that you want, but when you're done, know this, that the one who made the eternal decrees is called, the one who foreordained is called the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I may not know all about him. 
of course. But if he's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, I have nothing to worry about, and nor do you. And I'll tell you better than that. Nor does the rest of the world. However it works out, however it works out, and God does what's right, and God takes sin seriously. But, however it works out, they're in the best possible hands. Nobody gets a bad deal with the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For God is like Christ, and in him is no un-Christ likeness at all. Remember that funny old text in Revelation 13, 8? I'm following, the Greek text can be rendered in two different ways. So if you happen to be reading a Revised Standard Version or a couple of others, uh, you won't read it like this, but I'm following major versions. NIV, for example, speaks of people whose names are written in the book of life that belongs to the Lamb that has been slain from the foundation of the world. What does that mean? Lamb that was slain has been slain from the foundation of the world. And then there's that first Peter text, one nineteen. Well, in eighteen he said, "You were redeemed not with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your empty manner of life passed on to you by your fathers, but you were redeemed," he says, "by the precious blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ." He said, "Who was foreordained." from the foundation of the world, but is now revealed in these last times for you. What, is that, what does that mean? Well, the least it means, and it certainly means this, it means that God purposed the death of Christ. That's clearly the case. And if someone says, that's what that passage means, I'm sure they're right. I'm certain that they're right. It involves God's purposing. The cross wasn't a fly-by-night idea. God, God didn't send Christ into the world uh, in the hope that everybody would say, oh, let's have him. And he would live to be about 90 and teach his brains out and open the world's eyes with moral teaching and insight. He never sent him for that. And then, let's say he sent him for that, and they all turned against him, and God said, whoops, uh, they're going to kill him. Let's see what I can work out of that. That's not Bible. I didn't even begin to look Bible. God would tell you, that's not what I meant. That, that, that's not what I meant. I purposed this. See, I know that's right, but there's more to it than that. When we talk about the purpose of God, we tend to think, or at least we're tempted to think, that's sort of arbitrary. That God said, uh, let, let's see how I'll, I'll work this out. And he came up with this nice little plan. Like, uh, oh, I'll tell you what we'll do. Here, we'll make the world, of course, they'll end up sinning, and uh, how will we do it? Uh, let, let's do it this way. We'll, um, we'll have you, and, and the, they talk through each other. You will go, and they'll reject you, and ah, da, 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 da. what? That's not what happened. 
All of that's too arbitrary. The cross, listen to me, listen. No, 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 look up from your Bible. Listen to me. The cross was inevitable. It wasn't so much a choice. It was a choice. Do you hear me? It was a choice. It wasn't so much a choice as an inevitability. God being God. There was nothing else but a cross. We thank you for your interest in what do the scriptures say. We hope that you will come back to scripturesay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.